fragrance of all the heights and the depths. Now we ask you to accept the fragrance of our incense and establish peace among all nations of the earth and among the children of your holy church. Extend the right hand of your mercy upon us and upon our departed, that we may glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. According to the intention of his will, 
so that we might exist for the praise of his glory, we who hope first in Christ. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance towards redemption as God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Praise be to God Many of them have no title in it. 
So it seems that St. Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, but with the directive that it be sent around to the other churches also. So it has a bit more universality to it. Which is probably a reason why, though there are specific details to the Ephesians, it isn't like a letter to the Galatians where it is completely about what they're doing in that parish at that time that he needs to correct, or for example, even more clearly, to the Corinthians. So it's one of the reasons why this first chapter opens up with what we call a berakah in the Hebrew. It's a blessing. And in fact, what it is is a panoramic vision, this huge universal vision, cosmic vision in fact, we could say, of salvation. And the work that we have been initiated into by our baptism and by our faith. And of course, then it becomes the work of our response to what God is doing in this kind of universal vision. So St. Paul points out the Trinitarian aspect, and he points out past, present, and future, what the work of healing and what the work of redemption and bringing to salvation means. In the past, you'll note in the, the beginning of this epistle, he talks about the Father's election, the choice that's made by the Hidden One from all eternity that we at this present moment participate in in time. And each generation that moves by, they have that moment of time to be engrafted into that hidden selection, that hidden choice that God has made before the creation of anything from all eternity. And in the present, St. Paul emphasizes the aspect of adoption. We have been chosen to enter into that election. And then, of course, he turns us towards the future. And I've given you the word in the translation that you have in the bulletins, though in the lectionary that we used, it's something about summing up everything in Christ. But the word in the Greek is a technical word in a certain sense of recapitulation. That for us in English comes from the Latin, but it has the same meaning in the Greek. The center of the word recapitulation is the word kaput. C-A-P-U-T. And that's the Latin word for head. And so, literally in the Greek it means the up to, the lifting into the head. The Latin is used re capota, recapitulation. The action of bringing everything under one head. Sometimes it can mean something simple as making a, a list of numbers under a heading. But in this point, St. Paul is saying that the Christ is the revelation in the future that we will see in full glory, with everything in existence being brought under him as the singular head and the recapitulation of all that God desires to accomplish in his creatures. And so we have past, present, and future. Election, adoption, and of course he's emphasizing our response to that adoption, and the future recapitulation. Now I mentioned to you that this is a baraka in the Hebrew. This is St. Paul the rabbi giving this praise to God, the word praise and glory. Go through and count how many times he uses this word. And of course, when we talk about praise or honor, what does it mean? Praise is the recognition of excellence in someone or in something. And that recognition of the excellence means that we turn and we pay and respect honor. And so honor or praise depend upon our perception of what is this good and excellent thing in front of us. So St. Paul, when he does this praise of the Barakha, Barakh, we have it with Barakh Mor, you hear it all the time at the Mass. Barakh Mor or Omoran. Barakha means blessing, bless. Baracha is a blessing. It is a prayer of honor rendered to God. And what's interesting in these first 14 lines, so since the Middle Ages they've been numbered. But beside, in the Greek, besides the initial salutation of the first two lines, what for us are 12 more sentences, 12 more lines, in the Greek is one long sentence of St. Paul in this rendering of homage and praise to God for what He's accomplished, past, present, and future. 
You can also notice in this chapter that it's Trinitarian, the whole work of redemption. Oftentimes we emphasize the fact that our Lord died on Calvary, rose from the grave, brings us redemption through this death and resurrection. And this is true. But the redemption and the salvation is a much larger work than just that historical moment. And he shows in this, in this prayer the Trinitarian aspect, that it's the Father who redeems us by choosing to communicate the divine goodness. That the initial act of communicating divine goodness is to make things be, to exist. None of us have any choice in that. We're just made. But the second aspect of this, of what he calls the election, of giving of this divine goodness, that requires our correspondence reciprocated by free will to receive this gift of adoption. So we have the aspect of the Father who chooses. And we have the aspect of the Son who redeems us by that death and by that resurrection, who sets us apart, who consecrates us, and in this aspect of the holy ones who are in Ephesus, St. Paul is using uh, liturgical terms for the temple. And the notion of consecration, the saints who are in Ephesus, the holy ones, translated in the text we have today, it means those who have been consecrated in Ephesus, made sacred. And the sacred meaning for not only the Hebrews, but also the Greeks and the Romans, the notion of consecration is being set apart. God is the Holy One, not because of morality, but He is the Holy One because He is the completely other transcendent One. So He is holiness in itself. So He's talking to the people of Ephesus, is reminding them, you have been set aside and consecrated in a liturgical sense by your baptism, by your chrismation. And you notice later on in this chapter, he will talk about that you must return service that is unblemished. And the term that he's using is also liturgical. Because the unblemished in the Old Testament is referring to that which is fit to be offered to God. That which is fit to be sacrificed, to be offered to God. And then lastly, we have this very mysterious term concerning the Spirit that we have been sealed by the Spirit. And of course, the Father's comment on this meaning there is an inner transformation that remains there. We can say it metaphysically. It changes our mode of existence within us. We call it a character. We receive it in baptism. There is another character given in confirmation, chrismation. And a third character, which is holy orders for the men who are consecrated or ordained to the priesthood. But these characters are permanent, whether in heaven to our great glory or in hell to our profound shame. The character will never be removed. This is the seal, an aspect of what St. Paul is talking about, when we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And in the ancient world, when you seal something, when you put your seal on a thing, you show ownership and protection. It's a way you seal things that we say lock up. And it's also a way of showing that it belongs to me, which is why I protect it. And so St. Paul uses the Spirit of God given to us in this work of salvation. He uses the term Arha. And the Arha means a down, a down payment. I think today, or this morning, it was translated as the first installment. Right? It's layaway. And so you have the first installment placed on us because it is the promise for us of the fullness of the life to come in this recapitulation in glory. So we have all three aspects. And so it's a very magnificent, all I can say is, I always tell you to read the context of the epistles. Well, there's nothing before it, this is the beginning. You can read after if you want, but I think in fact these 14 verses are so rich. In fact, they are... You don't usually use the term, but they are lush in their richness. And to take out just one part of one line for a morning to consider as part of your prayers in the evening, take pieces of this during the entire week and just reflect upon this exuberant praise that St. Paul gives. 
Because all of this realization of what he's extolling in this prayer is the reality that the mother of God carries in her womb as we go through this whole season of the announcements. And of course, Christ has this aspect of being head. Now you'll notice in the central part of this baraka, St. Paul talks about the mystery. The mystery being revealed. We use this term mystery so often it tends to kind of go over our head. We just don't pay much attention to it. But the original meaning of mystery is from the Greek mystos, mystein. It doesn't mean silence. It means to be able to keep our mouths closed. And so the mysteries were those things that people were initiated into for the Greek classical world that they didn't speak about. So it's hidden. And so the mystery that St. Paul is using the word for here is talking about this whole vision, Trinitarian salvation, past, present, and future, election, adoption, recapitulation, all of this reality, which is the purpose for God's will, what He desires to do, which is why He made paradise, why He created Adam and Eve, why He created the human race, why He created the trees and the bunny rabbits. It's not for the sake of the bunny rabbits. It's for the sake of the adoption and the glorification and the expounding of the mystery that has been His will from all eternity. And that, St. Paul says, we announce to you. And to the Ephesians who have been consecrated and set aside, there is then a response to that word. So to leave you with that, all of this we can bring together by talking about our Lord's headship, centrality. In the bulletin this week, I talk about its aspect in reference to the church. So we're not going to do it in the sermon because you have it in the bulletin. <clears throat> but what St. Paul is pointing out here, there are three points. St. Paul points out that our Lord is head as being the center of the baptized personality. What defines me as being baptized? What makes me different from the Buddhist? What makes me different from the Muslim? It's not just the fact that some, at one point in my past somebody baptized me as a baby. But the fact that I come to realize consciously that Christ is the very center and the reason for my baptized existence, my baptized personality. It is meant to define my existence as a Catholic. But the second point is, is that this headship, this recapitulation, that Christ is the core which binds all of the supernatural organism together. Which is why he calls the church the body of Christ. It's not a club, it's not an association. It is a single corporate body of consecrated individuals. So Christ is the core, the very definition that holds together that organism. And then the third point is, by this vision of past, present, and future, that by the entrance of the eternal one into time, time itself is transformed. It is vitalized. Remember the word vital means living, lifelike. Vital refers to the, the animation, the life of something. So when we speak about the vitalization of time for St. Paul, we're talking about there's a reason why we have these moments of time given to us. And it's not just simply that we get up at five, we go to work, we work with our colleagues, we do the same thing, we come back to the same place, eat the same food, watch the same stupid television shows, and then go back to bed, and then do it again the next day at five. That is not the purpose of our existence. But the time has been renovated, renewed. And then the historical current that moves forward is moving us towards this recapitulation in Christ. Which is why, especially in the Syriac tradition, we make several references to this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and will come again. We are oriented in turn towards that recapitulation. It is that transformation of time. I'm not just simply here to live for 78 years and then keel over. Every moment is a revelation of the mystery. 
This is why this exuberance and this baraka. So like I said, just use this text this week. Because it is the aspect of our response to word. So the first week of announcements we considered word. The second week we considered the response to the word and the enunciation. And you notice that when we respond consciously, it is meant to be transformative in our lives. So we come to the third week of the visitation. Word to Zachary, mm, doubt. Silent until your son appears in this world. Second response magnificently of Mary of Nazareth. And Mary of Nazareth is transformed and she immediately leaves from that message of the angel Gabriel to visit her cousin Elizabeth, which is the visitation of this week. Word, response, conscious response, transformation in action. These are our first three weeks of the announcement. And so I leave you with that last line of the epistle today, because it's quite beautiful, with the sense of hope that we have been sealed by the transforming and Holy Spirit that we've received. This first installment of our inheritance as the children of God, that you were signed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God told you He was going to be given to you. Who is the pledge, the promise, the pledge of our inheritance, for the redemption of acquisition unto the praise of His glory. The purpose is glory and honor and reverence and adoration. And that redemption of acquisition, that is segula. I'll just leave you with the word segula. You can read the bulletin for once this week and find out what this acquisition is. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord.
Rather, treat us according to your promises. Forgive our sins, pardon us, and have mercy upon your inheritance. For this your repentant church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Baptism and receive the precious body and blood of your Son. They wait for. 
for you in your life-giving hope. Raise them up on the last day in your mercy. Forgive all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us to love to the divided and forgive the sins he hath created.
Gracious God and Father, how can we repay you for your goodness and for the salvation you have just given us? Who can give you the glory you truly deserve? In our weakness and insofar as we are able, we worship, praise, and thank you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our God, we worship, thank, and praise you. We implore your goodness and your abundant mercy for the salvation of the whole world, for the protection of the living and eternal rest to the departed, for the feeding of the hungry and the support of the needy, for the visiting of the sick and the consolation of the grieving. Through your grace, dwell in them. And by your abundant mercy, give them life. By your cross, bless your people and protect your inheritance. Adoration is due to you and to your Father, and to your holy and life-giving Spirit, now and forever. So we have two announcements for this week. Next Saturday is the Feast of the Mother of God and the Immaculate Conception. Under that title, she's also patroness, patron saint of the United States of America. But it's a holy day of obligation. And so, as of the Sunday, we have a serious obligation of assisting at Mass and also the sanctification of the day itself. So as usual then, we will have a Mass at the Vigil for the Immaculate Conception, which will then be on Friday evening at 6 p.m. And there will be the Mass at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning for the Immaculate Conception. And then of course, the weekend as usual with four for the Sunday. The second announcement is you have booklets in the pews that we've left around there. They were printed by the Eparchy last year. They're quite beautifully done. You are highly encouraged to take them with you. Read them. They're an excellent expose and explanation of the uh, succinct resume of the Maronite Church. Learn from them and use them for apostolic purposes to communicate to your colleagues and your friends and other associates. So by all means, take the books with you. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.